All right, so chapter 9 dealt with the hydrogen atom. And so what we want to look at now is what happens to quantum mechanics when we start to scale that up. What happens when there is more than one electron in the system? And so the next step will be to look at multi-electron atoms. What happens when we have an atom with just one nucleus but several or more electrons? And so the first step will be to take a look at a helium atom and to think about what quantum mechanics for the helium atom is going to look like. And we'll start this problem just like we've started almost every other problem, and that is figure out what the Hamiltonian will look like, and then try to find wave functions that fit that Hamiltonian. So a first guess at a Hamiltonian uh, might be something like this, where um, we have two kinetic energy terms, so this is the negative h bar squared over 2m, where m is the mass of an electron that we're used to. Del squared is an abbreviation for uh, d2, or uh, really partial to dx2, par plus partial to uh, dy2, plus partial to dz2. And then we have that same term for the second electron. And now our potential energy terms get a little bit more complicated because we're going to have to deal with um, potential energy repulsion between the two electrons. So that term is here. That's the positive term. Repulsion potential energies are positive. But then we have two attraction terms, one for electron one to the nucleus, one for electron two to the nucleus. And we notice here that this two shows up here and that's because the nucleus has a charge of two instead of just a charge of one. And so now we have our, our, uh, our first guess at how a Hamiltonian might look. Notice the R's here. This is the distance between electron one and two. This is the distance between the nucleus and electron two. This is the distance between the nucleus and electron one. And so we have our full Schrodinger equation at least approximated, at least guessed at. And like I said, the del squared operator is the uh, abbreviation for um, partial uh, two, um, partial x2 plus partial 2, partial y2, and so on. Um, and then this is the conversion of that to spherical polar coordinates. Um, and so we'll use that as our del squared as we move forward. And if we write that all out, this will get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, but just like other quantum mechanics problems, things get simpler by the end. Um, we'll begin with the orbital approximation that expresses the wave function as a product of one electron orbitals. And so we're going to assume that we can separate one electron's wave function from the other. It's not entirely true because the behavior of one electron is going to depend on the other because they, they interact, they repel each other. So this doesn't make the electrons in helium or any other system um, independent of one another. Um, because the electron-electron repulsion term in a Hamiltonian, it's no longer a spherically symmetric Hamiltonian. And so that makes solving this equation, finding an exact wave function, impossible. Um, so to solve the Schrodinger equation for many electron atoms, we have to use numerical methods instead of algebraic, instead of analytical methods. Um, and those are going to include some approximations, and we won't necessarily do those in our work, but we'll learn what they are and have an understanding of how computers do those. The most serious of these uh, approximations is that in order to make mathematics possible, it's assumed that the electrons move independently of one another. Um, but again, their motion is not independent, it's correlated. And the difference between the real energy of the system and the one that we get by assuming that their motion isn't correlated is referred to as the electron correlation energy or the electron correlation problem. So in order to solve the Schrodinger equation approximately without considering uh, correlation, we'll consider the other electrons 
in each wave function as a smear of negative charge determined by squaring the wave function of each of the other electrons. So for a 1s electron in a many electron atom, instead of a wave function that looks like this, we get a wave function that looks like this. Not very, very different. Um, this letter right here is the Greek letter zeta, so that's going to pop up here and here and be the only significant difference that we have between um, our hydrogen wave function and our helium wave function. This is going to relieve the asymmetry and the potential energy term of the Hamiltonian. It allows each orbital to be written as a product of radial and angular functions um, that are exactly like the hydrogen orbitals shown in chapter 9, um, except for with that zeta added. Instead of a n electron Schrodinger equation, we're going to have n one electron Schrodinger equations. So I have a Schrodinger equation for each of our electrons. Not too much different um, from having a separate Schrodinger equation for each degree of freedom in the three-dimensional box. And so they'll each have a separate energy and a separate wave function. Um, now the other question is, what is zeta? And we'll talk about that um, in a little bit more detail in a little while. Um, but to start out, we'll, we'll say that it does relate itself to Z. It is related to the charge on the nucleus, um, but it's not exactly the charge on the nucleus. It's not going to be 2 for helium. It's going to be a little bit less than 2 because it's the charge on average that each electron feels. It's the effective nuclear charge. And so each electron on helium doesn't feel the whole nucleus because, at least for part of the time, the other electron is partially blocking it. And so that is a term, that zeta, that's going to have to be um, numerically, variationally solved for. We'll talk about the variational method in a little while. Um, the other thing that we have to deal with when we have two or more electrons is this idea of electron spin. The stern gerlach experiment forced us to consider that electrons have an intrinsic angular momentum. Um, and when a charged particle has an angular momentum, that generates a magnetic field. Physics tells us that particles with angular momentum, s, will be split into two s plus one components when passed through a magnetic uh, field. Therefore, each electron has an intrinsic angular momentum of one half, according to the results of the stern gerlach experiment. So in order to incorporate the spin component of the wave function, it's necessary for systems with more than one electron that we define spin wave functions. And we're just for now going to call those alpha and beta. We're not going to write the functions themselves all the way out. Alpha and beta are eigenfunctions of the spin angular momentum operators S squared and Sz, just like um, other angular momentum operators defined in Chapter 7, except for the magnitude. Um, only the magnitude and one component can be known at the same time because of commutation rules. So we have a wave function um, that looks like this and like this uh, for our uh, spin uh, designated uh, wave functions. And again, we would need to put a zeta here and here, here and here, for systems that have more than one uh, proton in the nucleus. On the next slide, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of what we mean um, in that statement that these eigenfunctions, um, alpha and beta, are, like I said, eigenfunctions of the S squared and SZ operator. Let's move me down here so you can see the, uh, see the title. So the spin eigenfunctions alpha and beta, if we apply the S squared operator to that function, we're going to get h bar squared s times s plus 1. 
um, where s is one half. And so we get this term right here. If we apply the s squared operator to beta, uh, we're going to get the same thing. But if we apply the s z operator to alpha, we get h bar over 2. And if we apply the SC operator to beta, we get negative h bar over 2. So these are equal to one another, these spins, but they're opposite in direction. The opposite, um, our ability to see the opposite is removed by squaring it, because that negative becomes positive. But when we look at only the z component, we see um, plus and minus 1 half. As we mentioned earlier, um, I don't know, we didn't mention this earlier. I'm remembering from when I made these notes. Um, one of the principles of quantum mechanics is that two electrons, um, two identical particles in a system, have to be indistinguishable from one another. And so we refer to that as indistinguishability. This is a good uh, thing to keep in mind as a possible vocabulary uh, term on our last regular test and on the final. Um, because one electron can't be distinguished from one another, their wave functions have to be indistinguishable. The wave function itself is not an observable, but the square of the wave function is an observable. Um, the square of the wave function gives us electron density. Um, so what that means is that the square of the wave function that deals with two electrons has to be the same as the square of an electron a square of a wave function that deals with those two electrons in the opposite order. There's two ways that can happen. The symmetric case or the anti-symmetric case. In other words, switching the electrons can leave the wave function stay the same or switching the electrons can change the sign of the wave function. And um, only one of these is going to work based on the system that we have. Um, we'll talk about that in just a moment. And that leaves us to our final postulate. We've talked dealt, uh, all semester long with five postulates of quantum mechanics. The sixth postulate is Pauli exclusion principle, which we're going to put into math terms here in a moment. Wave functions describing a many electron system must change sign under the exchange of any two electrons. So the symmetric case would look like this. The anti-symmetric case would look like this. And then for those of you that are familiar with matrix algebra, start to think about what this looks like. Um, if you have ever looked at a 2 by 2 matrix um, and found the determinant of that, you'll notice that a 2 by 2 matrix has a determinant that is what we call AD minus BC. Um, we will take the upper right and lower, I'm sorry, the upper left and lower right, multiply those by one another, and the upper right and lower left and multiply those by one another, and the difference between those products is the determinant of the matrix. So we can make an anti-symmetric matrix by, uh, I'm sorry, we can make an anti-symmetric wave function by setting up a matrix determinant. Um, so this is the mathematics of the Pauli exclusion principle. Um, only the anti-symmetric version uh, fits the uh, Pauli exclusion principle as stated mathematically at the top of this slide. Um, and so the next uh, video that I'm going to start in a few moments is going to go through some of the detail of how to use matrices, matrix determinants. John Slater who came up with this. Uh, like I said, I think John Slater is probably the best physicist ever who doesn't have a Nobel Prize. I'm still looking into why that's the case. Um, but uh, we're about out of time for this video. Um, so the second video will deal with that subject.